Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker this evening is a political commentator, activist, writer and speaker. Mr David Pello is a political commentator and a new media activist with a blog and a YouTube channel called Pello Talk. Where is it? Um, He's also the architect of the annual Church and State Summit, founder of the Australian Free Speech Coalition, director of the Axiomatic Events and writes for The Spectator and Quadrant magazines. Excellent. His first-hand political experience includes being a successful election campaign director, winning a safe Labor seat for the LNP and serving the Family First Party for many elections in strategic roles on the Queensland State Executive until the party eventually merged with the Australian Conservatives. Now independent of any party, he interviews global thought leaders like senators and members of parliament, well-known lobbyists and ethicists, business and church leaders, academics and media personalities, all with very diverse worldviews and opinions about the issues that affect and shape our society. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Pallow. Thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of this forum. It's an exciting topic that's actually quite amusing to those of us from the southeast corner, where everything important is and happens. Amusing, as we've got no idea why you would want to lose the best part of Queensland. I was born just north of Brisbane and am raising my three children just south of Brisbane. But until recent years, I'd never experienced North Queensland. In a previous life as a finance broker, I flew to Mackay several times for business, but as part of the family first party state executive, was quite amused sometimes with, when dealing with some of the members and candidates up here to observe what seemed to be quite a large chip on the shoulders of many with regards to a perceived indifference by us in the southeast to those of you here in the north. I had no idea there even was such a thing. Um, not within Queensland. I mean, certainly we think those Mexicans south of the border all drive really terribly, um, but uh, nothing further about that. But sometimes this resentment verging on hostility was also amusing because it didn't feel slightest bit true to me. I never thought about people in Warwick or Toowoomba or, or anywhere else either. It's nothing personal. It's just the run-of-the-mill human condition known as self-interest. Complaints about uneven infrastructure investment seemed silly because of course government should spend money proportionately to where they could get the most bang for their buck, where the population is concentrated. And that's not Cloncurry, Cooktown or Cape York. It's Logan, the hub of the universe, as well as the Gold Coast and north to the Sunshine Coast. Now, I'm normally solutions-focused, so when I challenged the handful of whingers within the party about what they wanted done differently, they had some amateur ideas which were far from original and completely unhelpful for the context we were working with. So that was the background I had when I heard about this initiative, and its name, Boot Brisbane, and I actually laughed out loud. It's a very clever name. I'm grateful, though, for the opportunity to contribute to our exploration of the issue, as it is quite an intellectual adventure. I have no position for or against as I begin to weigh the pros and cons. Like I said, until last year I hadn't been any further north than Mackay, but then I participated in a Fathering Adventures event based in Townsville. I've actually got some flyers for the organisation called Fathering Adventures on uh, the table over there. It's absolutely fantastic. So good I've done it three times with each of my, well, once with each of my kids. Um, so we drove from Townsville in a minibus um, to and around Tully and a week of adventures with my son there made me love my state so much more and our north especially so. My trip to Cairns uh, a couple of months ago in July was equally great with a trip out to the beautiful and flourishing reef with Dan McCarthy who in my humble opinion would be hard to beat as your next federal member of parliament. I absolutely love it here. So I had to bring my bride on this trip with me to uh, share it with her as well. 
Of course, winter and spring are great times to visit, and I shall gratefully retreat to the southeast before summer's humidity. So I'd be very sad to see my great state chopped in half, and actually to lose so much of what has defined my identity as a Queenslander for as long as anyone can remember. But decisions like these aren't best made emotionally. Instead, we must take a step back and be as objective and clear-minded as possible. So let's start with the reasons for. Creating a new state creates a wonderful opportunity to get things right. You get to design a society virtually from the ground up. You can take advantage of the marvels of modern science and protect every person conceived here from the very moment their life can be observed. You can create marvellously pro-family laws which promote and encourage adoption so that it's not the rare and virtually impossible spectre it currently is in Queensland. People from around Australia would flock here to take advantage and the population based north of North Queensland would grow naturally and sustainably without a correlating influx of welfare dependence. You could withdraw from the national curriculum and achieve education outcomes to rival or maybe even surpass Kazakhstan. Once again, your children could focus on rigorous maths, real literature instead of texts, actual science instead of feelings, and proper history without the black armband. The new state of North Queensland could create a new health system, one where frontline services and efficiency are the objectives instead of artificially inflating employment figures with indulgent public service recruitment numbers whacked on the state credit card. You could bypass the arduous process of getting inner-city, latte-sipping, extreme environmentalists who've never been to a zoo, let alone a paddock, to agree to trusting you to own a gun and not hold up a bank or decimate protected species. Law reform would permit you to manage feral animal populations as authentic conservationists and have fun while doing it. You could also ignore their incessant screeching when you want to maintain the sediment build-up at river mouths. Making waterways accessible to and from the ocean would significantly build local industry and employment by using the many rivers which are navigable many kilometres inland currently, except for that very shallow bit right at the mouth. This gets many trucks off the road, which should placate some of the greenies frantic about emissions. It'll increase uh, road safety and reduce the costs of road maintenance, but most importantly, it would give access to many natural resources which are currently locked due to the expense of retrieving them by road, pipeline or rail, using the motorways of the sea like the Europeans have been doing for decades. A fortunate byproduct of riverbed maintenance means local councils can have a ready supply of cheap sand and aggregate for the concrete that all the infrastructure development you'll be doing will be needing. Speaking of the economic vandalism of environmental extremists, imagine a state where a handful of inner city electorates 2,000 kilometres away no longer dictate election outcomes and subsequent government policies regarding how you manage your farms as if you can't be trusted to think of future generations. Ridiculous interference making it harder to prevent erosion, feed livestock, manage regrowth would be neutralised and farmers could again work with two hands instead of one hand pinned behind their back. Now, I grew up in regional New South Wales, but I always supported the Maroons. <laughs> Despite a decade in the bush and travelling many thousands of kilometres in and around the smallest towns, North Queensland offers one particular site this country boy had never seen until I came here. Right there on national highways, right before each little bridge crossing sometimes a sometimes wet creek bed, are signs warning of crocodiles. Now I ask you, what on earth would a West End hipster know about managing crocodile populations? In the new state of North Queensland, you won't have to care anymore because their opinion shouldn't count and wouldn't count. These extreme greens provide so many good reasons for booting Brisbane and building a wall to keep them out, don't you think? Well, there's actually more. Imagine if local indigenous landowners were allowed to do what they wanted on their land without paternalistic micromanagement from George Street. These virtue signalling bleeding hearts keep telling us how guilty we are just for being white, supposedly because of English imperialism 200 years ago, 
And then, without any intended irony, they impose their presumed superiority upon blackfellas who've been managing this part of the world for millennia. One of my personal favourite reasons for getting rid of you northerners would be cutting the dead weight holding us back from finally synchronising our clocks with the businesses less than an hour drive south of Brisbane. Sure, I'd prefer to make them stay on God's time, but failing that, I just want to be able to talk to the businesses and colleagues in Sydney and Melbourne after 4pm each day. There's more of them than you, so it just makes sense to me. You'd be able to determine your trading hours that suited you instead of Brisbane. You'd be able to decide if you really need to keep um, all those public holidays paying people for doing nothing, or you may want more. You are trying to build something here after all. You could also abolish stamp duty to attract more homeowners or even be so forward-thinking as to craft a special economic zone to attract large employers with tax incentives. If you really want to create jobs and attract big business, promise to never implement the hideous insanity of payroll tax. Why do we have tobacco tax? To discourage consumption of tobacco. Why do nanny state fanboys promote and, and promise an Alco Pops tax or a sugar tax because they believe it will discourage and reduce consumption of those products. So what on earth are states thinking when they introduce and maintain a payroll tax? Do they want less employment? Yes, creating a shiny new state with laws that protects the people and gets government out of our lives and out of our pockets to, will build, is a great opportunity to build our national productivity. You will attract small business owners, large employers, homeowners, people with traditional family values and conservative common sense from all around Australia. And that brings me to the first reason against creating a new state. You will create a brain drain on thinking people from South Queensland. They will become refugees from the elected dictatorship of our un unaccountable unicameral parliament and they will flood north across the border to the land of opportunity that you create. The few Christians, conservatives and capitalists left will inherit a hellish nightmare comparable to the socialist state of Victoria, Stan, or worse, California. It was hard enough to get my wife acclimatised to the humidity of southeast Queensland. I have no chance of getting her agreeing to move to Cairns. Please don't do this. Who will pay our debt? It's already so big that our kids won't be able to pay off whatever we've already spent it on without asking them. We were counting on North Queensland mining royalties to pay off the tunnels and freeways we've already built, not to mention the Cross River Rail I know you want us all to have to ease our commute. What will the weed-smoking, doll-bludging Greens voters do when they can't plot how to ruin, I mean run, the cane farms and crocodile populations they've become so proficient in their expertise of? I'll tell you what they'll do. There'll be more street art on modern buildings and protests to save derelict buildings. They'll imagine new problems that don't exist, like the rape culture of the local dog parks and toxic masculinity of under six footy competitions. We will never get them out of our lives and it'll be your fault. Another reason against is we will have to waste vast amounts of money on reprinting maps and atlases. Serious question, though. Do you expect to be able to keep the maroon jersey? What will happen to the state of origin? Will it become a three-way competition? Should we add the socialist state of Victoria stand to it? Have you thought through these vital questions, Matt? I believe in the vision of Australia which our founding fathers had. Many people naively believe we have too many levels of government and states should be the one to go but they generally base this on a basic dislike of politicians and a very light grasp of our history. We are proud, independent colonies, each with our own timeline, history and culture. Federation was intended not to centralise power, but to strengthen our ability to defend ourselves and remove obstacles to trade with the other Australian colonies, like having the same size railroad tracks. We were not meant to become homogenised and equalised, but to retain our uniqueness as states and power of self-determination. The fact is that there are less public servants needed 
in decentralised bureaucracies. It's counterintuitive, I know, but that's the fact. If you don't like the number of politicians we've got now and think getting rid of the states is the answer, A, you'll have to get a new constitution, and B, you'll have infinitely higher taxes or far less services because of the infinitely bigger public service needed. The better plan is to make the Commonwealth government smaller. Get rid of the Federal Education Department, the Federal Health Department, the Federal double handling of all the things states do. Take back the state powers to determine labour regulations and collect income tax. Let the money stay and benefit where it was collected. If you're just going to become another face at the table begging for the scraps of GST collected by the Commonwealth and returned with cents in the dollar if you jump through enough hoops, you will not have created anything new or nation building and will have simply squandered a wonderful opportunity to create a, a government by the local people for the local people. Competitive federalism increases efficiency of government because states with bad policies have to change them because no one else is going to pay for them. People leaving South Australia can be called electricity refugees because that state has the highest cost of electricity in the entire world. A state with a great supply of clean burning coal and well-maintained power stations will not only make the cost of living lower, but also make the average income higher by creating more jobs. Lower business operating costs lets owners invest in wages, which increases their productivity, which increases their profits, instead of wasting money on intermittent energy, which increases nothing except blackouts, hence the South Australian electricity refugees. Centralised government means we all pay for the bad decisions of other states out of the fruit of our good decisions, reducing the incentive to make good decisions and the pain of making bad ones. Competitive federalism means each government acts primarily in the interests of its own residents to personally reap the benefits of responsibility. We get to observe policy experiments in other states and imitate what works and reject what doesn't. Tasmania's crocodile management policy simply wouldn't work here. I don't know if they have one, because I'm pretty sure they don't need one. There are some things your southern brothers simply have no qualification to have an opinion on about policies for North Queensland. Just tell my mum I'll be late for dinner. <laughs> when there is a centralised common government, indistinguishable from various regions in laws, policies and styles of government, you can honestly only hope to keep 51% of people generally happily, happy, or everybody happy maybe half the time. When competition creates choice, you can reasonably expect as many as 70 to 80% of residents will be generally happy. Federalism takes decision making down to the people and in so doing satisfies more people's preferences. There is no doubt in my mind that North and Central Queenslanders must be asked what they want. And I see no reason why it shouldn't be asked at the next election. I applaud the question, no matter the answer, and the conversations happening now to determine how the new state would look and what precisely you should be asked to support or reject. Channel 9 asked me this morning if I, thought we should, if I thought we should have a new state. I answered that I believe in liberty and that Australia is meant to be a liberal democracy. So if North Queenslanders want a new state, then the Queensland Parliament must immediately give its necessary approval to North Queenslanders creating a new state. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that uh, entertaining speech. David, um, unfortunately, the Tasmanian uh, crocodile management policy is the one currently being implemented by this government in far north Queensland. <laughs> and I certainly think that sorting out the state of origin football should be our first priority. Ladies and gentlemen, thank David Pellet. Our next speaker this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is a professor of law, Professor David Flint AM. Professor Flint read law and economics at the universities of Sydney, London and Paris. After admission as a solicitor of the New South Wales Supreme Court in 1962, 
He practised as a solicitor from 1962 to 1972 before moving into university teaching, holding several academic posts before becoming Professor of Law at the U Sydney University of Technology in 1989. He is an Emeritus Professor of Law, Chairman of the Australian Broadcasting Authority and Associate Member the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission from 1997 to 2004. He is also the President, English-speaking Union and National Convener of, of Australians for the Constitutional Monarchy. He was Chairman of the Australian Press Council from 1987 to 1997. In the same years, he was Dean of Law at the University of Technology, Sydney. During his term, significant changes to the Australian legal education system were made. Now, I have a list of them here. Trust me, it is long, it is extensive, and it is very, very impressive, but too much for me to read out tonight. Professor Flint is the author of numerous publications. His publications include books and articles on topics such as the media, international economic law, Australia's constitution, and on Australia's 1999 constitutional referendum. He was recognised with the award of the World Outstanding Legal Scholar World Jurist Association Barcelona in October 1991, and he was made a member of the Order of Australia in 1995. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the, to the podium tonight, Professor David Flint. <laughs> AM. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I cannot say that I come without criticism because uh, the former Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, once said in a book that I am not a constitutional lawyer. Uh, that book was a book of his uh, diary concerning fighting the referendum. It was called Fighting for the Republic. Julian Lisa at the time said it should have been called Whinging for the Republic. If I were speaking to you at some time in the future, I would be saying something like this. So a few years hence, I am absolutely delighted to be invited to speak in Cairns, the capital of North Queensland, to one of the country's preeminent think tanks, the North Queensland Foundation, formerly known as Boot Brisbane. I had the opportunity today to visit the North Queensland Parliament House formerly the Cairns Masonic Temple, whose Masonic Hall provides a magnificent chamber for the North Queensland Legislative Assembly. It's also good to see the small chamber being used for your upper house, which you've sensitively decided to follow the American practice for and call it not the Legislative Council, because most people think that has something to do with garbage, not what's being talked there, but garbage collection. You call it the North Queensland Senate. And I think you were very right to include in your constitution a requirement that in return for the generous financial benefits the political parties get and the exemptions they get from the law, the privacy law and the electoral law, they must be always open, transparent and democratic. You're also sensible to include a right for the people to petition for recall elections. That is to say the people could petition at any time for a specific Member of Parliament or for the whole government to be returned to an election, as in many American states, and a right in the people to initiate referendums which could repeal and make new laws. I'm very much interested in going tomorrow to visit Government House, Floriana, once the home of Maltese immigrants Paul and Paulina Zamet. I'm particularly interested in seeing the restoration, including that of the large ballroom which had been turned into flats in the 1940s. The new, the new ballroom has proved very popular for receptions and investitures, especially for awards in your much sought after Order of the Southern Cross, with its emblem, your beautiful flower, the Xanthosia. I'm especially looking forward to meeting that impressive man, the Governor of North Queensland, His Excellency Sir Jonathan Thurston. <laughs> I do recall that one of the strongest arguments for the formation of the news tech, apart from the aspirations of the people of North Queensland, 
was the fact that on population, on voters, on size of the country and resources, North Queensland would easily qualify as a state in any comparable federation, Canada, the United States, Germany, or Switzerland. These are all federations where, sta where states are more powerful than those in Australia. They are all less centralised, and yet North Queensland could easily be a state there. According to expert reports, the degree of over-centralisation both in the states and in Canberra and Australia, and the degree of over-regulation that results from this, costs us between 10 to 21 per cent of our GDP. Our GDP in 2017 was 1.69 million. That means, if you translate that, that means that somewhere between 170 billion to 200, 340 billion is wasted each year by the over-centralisation in Canberra and in Brisbane and the other capitals. That's not just a one-off. That is every year. The Toomey Withers report in 2007, which went to the premiers, said that if we reverted to becoming the true federation which was intended, for example, something like Switzerland or Western Germany or Canada, we would be saving 10% of the GDP. Naturally, of course, that was filed away. If we return to true federal principles, there would be an enormous saving. And the interesting thing I'm saying in this speech I'm giving years later, the interesting thing is that the new state of North Queensland produces a very healthy surplus for the obvious reason that it now has for North Queensland much of the income which was diverted by the government down south. Continuing my speech, the new state was created as a result of the constitutional reforms adopted by a recent All-Australian Constitutional Convention. This led to the creation of North Queensland as well as movements for new states elsewhere, especially in New South Wales and Victoria. That's what I would be saying if I were to come back in a few years' time. But let me return to October. 2018. I'm very impressed by the new organisation. I think it's wonderful. And I like the name, Boot Brisbane. I think it will lead to similar organisations in other states. For example, SAC Sydney <laughs> and MUG Melbourne. And nationally to restore the Federation and stop Canberra pushing its nose into state affairs, as David said. For example, into education, which is not a Commonwealth matter, it's a state matter, and returning to its core duties where it is so poorly performing, such as defence, for example, we, we only have 21 days of fuel in this country. If we were to find that there were problems to the North, how on earth would we move our army around? And we wouldn't be wasting, we wouldn't be allowing the raiding on the defence budget that Labour started and the coalition has increased substantially, that is using the defence budget to shore up seats which are marginal, which are held by the coalition, particularly seats in South Australia. Coming to new states, it's clear that it was always intended that there would be new states in Australia. And we've seen section 124 on the screen. The, the point is that it can only be created, a new state can be only created from an original state with the consent of the parliament of the original state. The weakness here, and we, had a one, we have a wonderful constitution, but obviously being human, there are some weaknesses. For example, that the high court is appointed, judges of the high court are appointed by the central government, the federal government. It would have been better if appointments of the high court rotated between the states so that you had more Queensland judges, so you had more West Australian judges, and so that you had at least one South Australian judge. That would have been better. There are weaknesses in the Constitution, and this is very much a weakness. The politicians, the politicians will always be reluctant to cede power. You'll never find the politicians of any state willing to agree to the formation of a new state. It's interesting when you go back to the convention debates. 
the convention held before Federation, you'll find that the question of North Queensland and the question of Central Queensland was actually discussed in the convention. And there was a proposal for a new clause, an additional clause to go into the Constitution to reserve the powers of the Crown, that is the British Crown, the powers of the Crown to subdivide Queensland into three states. Edmund Barton, our first Prime Minister, suggested that the clause be withdrawn. There was a proposal for the clause. He said, please withdraw it. We must first consult with the Premier of Queensland, which they did. They consulted with the Premier of Queensland and he telegraphed that this would endanger the passing of Federation by Queensland. Queensland might not join the Federation if this were passed, but it had the strong support of two interesting organisations, the Northern and Central Separation Leagues. So you had two organisations saying they wanted it. Finally, the convention decided that it wasn't something that they should risk, otherwise they might lose Queensland from the Federation. The wonderful thing, the wonderful thing about a federation is the competition that can exist between states, as David has told you. Many people will say we should, we should abolish the states, get rid of them and just have municipalities and shires and also have the central government. That would be a very bad thing. And I think this state, the state of Queensland, has demonstrated in a classic case the great advantages of competition between the states. And that was years ago when Sir Joe Bielke Peterson, against the advice of his treasurer, against all economic advice, decided he would get rid of death duties. At the time, I was an article clerk in a law firm and I'd seen how terrible death duties are. They are really, they can really be a cruel tax, particularly on small business and even worse on farms, because the tax is imposed at the very time that the family is suffering. They've lost the, the principal person in the family. And then they receive a bill from the government to surrender about 30% or something ridiculous of the value of their property. And if you've got a farm, it's very difficult. They may already have mortgages. It was very difficult to raise that 30%. You would have to sell off part of the farm to pay that. It was a very cruel and wicked tax. The very rich did not have to pay it because they had the lawyers and the accountants to engage in schemes to avoid the tax. And of course the poor didn't pay that because they didn't have the assets. It was the middle class who were particularly affected and worse, the farmers. So Joe abolished death duties and what happened? The people of Australia, the elderly people of Australia began to decide that they would rather leave their assets to their family rather than handing over a good proportion of that to the state government. And gradually, elderly people began to move to Queensland. It really sent shudders of horror through every other state in Australia within two years. Because of this example of competitive federation, Australia ended up with no death duties at all in Australia, and the Commonwealth abandoned its own death duty, which they called a state duty. It's a marvellous example. That would not have happened. We would still have death duties if we had no states. If we just had municipalities, we just had a central government, they would decide exactly what they wanted to do and you'd never have that sort of example. So what you, should you be doing? I was in the engine room of the 1999 referendum campaign. That was a campaign when over two thirds of the po politicians, probably more, jumped onto the bandwagon for a republic. And they did that not because they believed in it, they ripped up, shredded their oaths of allegiance. They did it because they were told by the commentary, by the media, and by the republicans that this republic was inevitable. And they believed that, and they jumped onto that bandwagon. And it was supported by every newspaper in Australia, by the ABC, the SBS, and eventually all of the, com the commercial TV outlets. And we didn't have much money, we did it on the smell of an oily rag, but how we won was to have essentially a military operation, a very tight operation, with daily meetings of the Central Command by telephone across Australia. But what we did have, what the great resource we had, 
we had almost 60,000 foot soldiers across Australia, people willing to work in each electorate. That's what you need. The Republicans didn't have that. <clears throat> the sort of people who belong to the Australian Republican movement like to go to celebrity dinners and meet all sorts of fancy people. They had to borrow the foot soldiers from the ACTU and the Labour Party, and that didn't produce the same commitment. And that, I think, was crucial. So what you really have to do is continue what you're doing. That is to try and persuade the people of North Queensland that it is self-evident that this new state would be much better off and much more in control of its destiny and the use of its resources than being part of a larger state. I would suggest a pincer movement, firstly, that you continue doing that. But knowing that the politicians in Brisbane are really the ones which are going to decide this, and they will do anything to stop it from happening, even if there's enormous pressure from North Queensland, it's going to be very hard to get them to do it. And they're quite likely to be as tricky as they were in New South Wales and to arrange a border which would and con the people of uh, North Queensland or the people who are running the campaign into having some sort of border which will ensure defeat. That's what happened in New South Wales. I think you have to campaign, as in the military, from both sides, not just frontally, but from the other side. And that doesn't have to be the organisation, but the people really have to do that. The second part of that pincer movement, I think, is a significant a campaign for the significant reform of the Australian Federation. The fact is that representative democracy in Australia and the two principal political parties have been captured. They no longer are controlled by their members. They are controlled by small cabal, cabals of power brokers. And too often in pre-selections, we see it all the time, too often in pre-selections, the pre-selection is decided not on merit. The pre-selection is decided by the loyalty of a particular candidate to the power breaker. So you get into Parliament people who are self-interested, who have a loyalty to a particular power broker, but they have no national and no state interest. I think, uh, I think we're in a situation now which is the worst we have seen in this country. And we've, at the same time, become more centralised. Much more power is in Canberra than in the capital of any other federation in the democratic world in Switzerland, in Germany, in Canada or the United States. We're in a situation where 80%, 80% of taxes are collected by Canberra. Half of that is handed back to the states and a good proportion of that is handed back with instructions on how to spend it. So the sovereignty of the states has been removed. The states in many respects become puppets of Canberra. And that means that Canberra, trying to do things like get involved in school education, mismanages that. And we've heard, the, we've heard what's happened with Canberra and the schools. The standards of our schools are falling, particularly in mathematics and in literacy, as David mentioned. In one respect, our standards are now lower than those of Kazakhstan. Our standards are much lower and falling, constantly falling, in relation to the countries to the north where they use old systems of education, where they have the teacher out the front, where the children learn by rote the basic parts of education. They, do, they give the education which was given to me when I was a boy and it is much more effective, not the new theories of education which are practised. And with two organisations, state governments, and the federal government running, running or trying to run education, it's like having two drivers in a motor car. It's uncontrollable. And what happens with education is other forces slip in, cultural Marxists slip in, and they end up introducing into the educational uh, teaching such matters as gender change, gender fluidity, and all sorts of ridiculous things instead of concentrating on core matters. That's where our federation is, and what we need, 
what we need is to look at that. I often suggest to people that I cannot identify one significant problem which, if it were not caused by our, popula by our politicians, has been made significantly worse by them. I can't identify one problem, one significant problem in this country, which, if it was not caused by the politicians, has been significantly made significantly worse by them. And people cannot, I find, people cannot identify such a problem. Sometimes they say the drought. But the problem is the politicians have failed, since I was a little boy, in a project to drought-proof the country. The last time we built a dam for Sydney was Warragamba. Unfortunately, we did. It was a dam for a, million, a city of a million people. Now it uh, services a city going up to five million, but we have no more water than that. And we're not, because we don't drought-proof the country, we're not fulfilling our vocation of being the food basket of Asia and of the world, but worse, as one farmer was explaining to me carefully the other day, we are gradually becoming net importers of food in the most ridiculous areas where we should be, we should be de depending on our own farmers. This is exacerbated by the politicians and the bureaucrats persecuting our farmers. They're treated like kulaks in the old Soviet Union, I'm told they're even subject to, to satellite surveillance and they're massively fined if they move a rock or feed their starving cattle with mulga. Well, what should we be doing? There is, in the Constitution, for example, a guarantee that the farmers and others have a right to the reasonable use of rivers. That's a guarantee in the Constitution. Our founders spent a couple of weeks at the last session in Melbourne putting that into the Constitution, the politicians and the activist judges have made that a dead letter. We have to do something. We have to do something significant. And I think there is a solution. We federated, we federated by taking the question of federation away from the politicians. It became obvious at a meeting in Korowa in 1892 that we were never going to federate if we left it to the politicians of the six colonial parliaments. Because what happened was a constitution was developed by a convention, then sent to each of the colonial parliaments. They then squabbled among themselves. Had that question not been taken from them, we would probably be now six independent separate countries, something like South America, without the disorder, but separate countries. We would never have federated. At Corowa in 1892, John Quick proposed, and his name should be known by every child in every school in Australia, but he's not. John Quick proposed that in future, this question should be sent to a convention elected by all of the people, and that convention should consult with the politicians, but then send the constitution directly to the people with the people by referendum deciding whether or not they would accept it. Well, there had to be two rounds of referendums because the people of my state, who, as you know, are difficult people, our state rejected it. So it had to be done again, changed and done again. And then it had to be taken to London because of the colonial status of the six colonies. It had to be approved by the British Parliament. That whole process, that extraordinary process, took only four years. It was done without any violence, without any deaths, wars, without any punch-ups anywhere, no recorded one. It was an extraordinarily sophisticated effort by our country, of which we should be extraordinarily proud. No other country has ever done this before. In four years, in New South Wales, the New South Wales government can't lay a tram track down George Street in four years. It's going to take about six years. But it was, it was absolutely wonderful. What we need, what we need is to look at that lesson. We, <clears throat> we must always learn from history and how sad it is, how absolutely sad that the children of this country are not being taught the history of this country, how we were formed, and the things that were achieved. 
what we should be doing is learn from history and use and go to the people. There's much more common sense in the average Australian than there is in the politicians. No reason why they should be better than anybody else. They're not so specially gifted. We should hold another convention to review the Constitution, and that would allow us to give us back our country, which is the name of a book I wrote a few years ago. The Korowa Conference sets out the way to do it, and I think it would allow us to control the politicians, but it would also allow us to achieve a new system in Australia which would save a lot of money, but which would allow, through referendums, citizen-initiated referendums, the people of a given area of an old state to form a new state, if they so wished. You could have a petition in this part of the country, and I think it would be more likely that the people of Queensland seeing that North Queensland wanted to split, I would think that the people of Queensland would probably agree with that much more than the politicians would in Brisbane. We're in a desperate situation today. The formation of this group, Boot Brisbane, I think is fortuitous because it indicates the importance of the people in correcting the situation in Australia. Remember, I cannot identify a significant problem in this country which, if it wasn't created by the politicians, has been made significantly worse by them. The important thing is that the people rule, and I think if you continue what you're doing, if you continue in your brilliant education campaign, as we saw on the slides tonight, to demonstrate that North Queensland would be far better off without being part of Queensland, but also by requiring that there should be some form of reform, a general reform of the Constitution of Australia to prove governance across the country, this would be a significant achievement. Thank you very much.